Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Aquarium Online Academy. My name is Emily, and I'm in the education department here at the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach. Today, I'm joined by my friend Allie, who is behind the computer, so she can change all the things behind me. And we've got James over at the questions computer. So as you join us today, if you ha have any questions, feel free to text us right here. Our phone number is 562-286-186. Three, eight. And then if you're not watching this on Monday morning at 10 a.m., you can email us and we will email you back uh, within a day or so. The email is live, L-I-V-E, at L-B-A-O-P dot org. All right. So wonderful. Let's get started. Now, today we're going to be talking about a very large grouping of animals. Now, take a moment right now, close your eyes, and think when you, when I say the word animal, what animals do you think of? Hmm. Maybe it was a dog or a cat. Ooh. Maybe was it a bird or a whale? How many of you actually thought jelly, sea jelly? Oh, maybe some of you because I put it, we put it behind me. But usually when we say animal, and if you were to go out and do a scientific survey of all the people that you knew and you said, name an animal most of them would probably name an animal like a cat or a dog or a bird or squirrel, something that's really familiar to us. Well, there's something that all those animals have in common. So when I think about a dog, a cat, or horse, squirrels, goats, cows, pigs, things like that, all those animals, they've got something inside of them. They've got bones. But it turns out if we were to go out and as scientists explore all the living things that are out there in nature, um, all the living animals, sorry, that are out there in nature, it turns out most of the animals out there have no bones at all, none. And they're called invertebrates. Try and say that out loud, invertebrates. Yeah, oh, actually say it one more time, but say it like a robot, invertebrates. That's what we're going to be talking about today. Now, the animals with bones, with backbones, like if you reach back, you can feel your backbone all the way down. We've got bones. You can feel your ribs. You can even feel the bones in your face. We are vertebrates. But it turns out most of the animals that are out there are invertebrates. They have no bones at all. Hmm. Well, today we're going to explore some of those invertebrates. Now, we're going to start with a group that happens to be uh, one of like that includes the the animals that are right behind me. So let's start and take a look right here. You know what this is. These are sea nettles. So this is a type of sea jelly. Now, if you thought to yourself, what's one thing that you know about jellies? Hmm. The first thing that came to my mind, is this the first thing that came to your mind too? Is that they sting. Yeah, that's true. So it turns out there's a whole grouping of animals that are invertebrates. They have no bones at all that are stingers. And the jellies are one of them. Now, this group is called cnidarians. I'm going to go ahead and write the word out here for you because this is a new word maybe for a lot of people. Um, and I'm going to write it here on my sideboard. So when I say cnidarians, it, it's a weird looking word. So cnidarians, that's a big word that we as scientists use for stinging animals. So I'll write stingers right here. Now, it's not all animals that sting. It does not include bees and things like that. But it does include a grouping of stinging animals. The jelly was one. So let's take a look at um, maybe another couple pictures of jellies and, um, and see if there's other things that we see. Or pictures or videos, Allie. Oh! Right here, a beautiful image of a cnidarian, a jelly that's a stinger. So it's got the big bell. That's its main, the main part of its body. And then, of course, you notice that they have these long, flowing tentacles there. So how do they use their tentacles? And what do you think they use them for? Yeah, you, so we know that they sting with them. So that these long tentacles are what they use to sting. And that's actually how they capture their food. 
they also happen to use it for defense because it turns out it's really handy if you have lots and lots of stingers coming down um, off of your tentacles there. So this is how they capture their food. And then do you see these like soft arms right in the middle? Those actually, um, those aren't the stinging uh, tentacles. Those are actually what we call mouth arms. And so that's what they use to sweep up the food off their tentacles. And then they put it into their bellies, into their stomachs. So these animals, jellies, have all these stinging cells all along these long, long tentacles. And that's the thing that's true, that, that's in common with all of the cnidarians, which is a type of animal with no backbone. Um, or no bones at all. It's an invertebrate. If you were to touch a jelly, what do you think it would feel like? Yeah, so if you touch them like we do here at the aquarium, this is the kind of jelly that we have to touch, they feel like jelly. They are really, really soft. In fact, most of their body is made up of water. They're simple animals, so they don't have uh, real true organ systems. Um, they don't have like brains or hearts or anything like that. Um, but they're, they're pretty neat animals. You can see them right here. And if you were to touch it, it would feel soft, like a jelly, like jellies, right? So these animals, are, as I mentioned, are cnidarians. They're stingers. Can you think of any other animals that look kind of like this, but maybe aren't quite, like they don't float around like this? Hmm. It turns out, what if we took a jelly and we turned it upside down and instead of floating like this, we let it stick to the ground. Can you think of any other animals that maybe feel really soft, have stinging tentacles, but instead of floating like this, they're sort of stuck like this? Any ideas? I'll give you a hint. I'm gonna go get a model of one. So it's made of plastic and I'm gonna get my model right here. Has anybody ever seen a creature that looks kind of like this. Doesn't it kind of remind you of the jelly there? Yeah, so this is a beautiful picture of a sea anemone. Woo, that's a tough one to say, right? A sea anemone are, um, they're actually like the cousins of jellies. You can imagine, a jelly's kind of like this, right? It's, it's got that big bell, it's got all the singing tentacles. This time we took that uh, jelly and this is their distant cousin. We stuck it on the ground. They still have those stinging tentacles. That's how they capture their food. And now you can see with this model, the mouth. You can also see the mouth inside here. So anemones wave their tentacles in the air. They sting their food, and then they pop it into the middle. They pop it into their mouth, and that's how they eat. But they're another stinger. And wait, did we talk about this? Do these have bones or no bones? No bones, you're right. These are all invertebrates. And if you were to touch this animal, it would feel kind of squishy too. They're usually a little bit tougher feeling than jellies, but they're, they're pretty squishy. They're pretty soft there. This is an animal that you can touch here at the aquarium um, inside, uh, inside our building. All right, so, um, oh, we got some good questions too. Um, going back to the jelly. So we're still talking about cnidarians here. Um, Jagger wants to know, what are the round glowy parts on the, on the jelly there? So, um, and we'll see an image of it in just a second. So when the jelly turns and, oh, right here, and you can see the circle, and then it looks like it's got like, sort of the, it almost looks glowy, like pink, and it, it looks like a cartoon flower. It kind of looks like something if you were gonna draw four big petals. Um, those are actually the stomachs. So that's where they put their food. Now here at the aquarium, what's really cool is um, we feed our jellies, we feed them pink food. Yeah, they're, they're baby brine shrimp, so they're pink. And we pour it in and the jellies have to sting their food and then they put it inside of them. It goes into their stomach tissue so they can start to break it down and get all the nutrients out of it. And their stomachs turn pink. So what's really cool is we can always tell when an animal has eaten. Yeah, so this is a stinger, stinging animal. These are also stinging animals. Here at the aquarium, when we feed these, we just pour the food in, and then they, the jellies have to swim into their food. Um, when we feed an anemone, they still have to sting their food, but we actually usually, we help them out a little bit. We just put the food right there on their tentacles. And in the case of a big anemone like this, we'll feed them pieces of like clam, um, sometimes little chopped up pieces of shrimp and things like that. So these are all stinging animals though, so they sting.
tentacles, and then they put it inside of them. This is a great view of our touch lab, our North Pacific touch lab. Um, this is a place where you could touch if we were open on the inside. Um, and you can see that we have all these anemones here. Oh, there's a bunch of animals here. And we're going to be talking about um, some of these different animals today. But you can see we've got different types of anemones here. There's one way over here as well. And so different types of anemones, they come in different sizes and different colors. But the one thing they all have in common is those stinging tentacles. They used to sting their food, and then they pop it into their mouth right there. Now, there's actually another cousin of the sea jelly and of the anemone. And maybe it's a cousin that you might not have realized. Yeah, I'll show you. Oh, good clue, Allie. Excellent. Did you know that the creatures that you see behind me, not the fish, the other creatures, those are the cousins of a jelly and an anemone. Yeah, corals. Corals are animals and they are an invertebrate. So they have no bones and uh, they actually sting. So they sting to get their food. So this is the thing that all of these uh, creatures that we've talked about so far, the cnidarians, they all have in common. They're stingers and that includes jellies, anemones, and corals like these. Now you might say, wait a second, this doesn't even look like an anemone or a jelly, but let's zoom in and take a look. So if you were to like zoom all the way into a coral, this is actually what they look like. On the outside, they actually have lots of tissue, just like you have skin and muscles on the outside of your bones. They actually have, um, they have like a stony skeleton on the inside. It's not true bones, but it's like a structure that gives them shape. And then on the outside, they have this softness. And then what do you notice? tentacles. They sting their food too. And just like anemones and just like jellies, they sting their food and then they bring it inside and they put it inside of their mouth and then that's how they grow. The other cool thing about corals is because they've got really little tentacles, sometimes they also rely on the algae that live inside of them. So they actually have um, plant-like creatures that live inside of them and then that gives them food too. All right. Great, um, great observation so far. So we can see all of these animals are invertebrates. They're stinging animals. That includes the jellies, the anemones, and the corals. Now we're getting some great questions in once again, just as a reminder, if you have questions, feel free to text us um, and we can answer your questions live on air. We got a question um, for, about the jellies now. Do jellies have eyes? Great question. So Jellies, as I mentioned, don't have true organ systems. Like they don't have, um, they don't have like the heart and brain that we we have. Uh, but they actually do have some ability to see. So they have really what I would call really simple eyes. Now your eyes, when you use your eyes, you can see things. Like you can say like, oh, that is my friend, or oh, that is a plate of nachos that I want to eat. Right. So those are things that you can see. Jellies don't have an image forming eye, which is another way of saying they can't see you or me or a plate of nachos, but they can see light and dark. And what happens is if we were to look around the edge of that bell, they actually have all these little um, eye spots that can see light and dark. And that's mostly important just because jellies drift around and they float and it's helpful for them to know if it's daytime or nighttime a lot um, because food may be available at different times of day for them, um, depending on where they live and the type of jelly. So, um, but they do have the ability to see light and dark. Great question. Um, another question we got was what kinds of food can they eat? So that's another, that's a great question. And that really depends on the jelly. So um, different jellies have different stinging ability and they live in different places and then they have like different mouth arms and stuff. So there are some jellies like nettles that can eat um, other jellies. They can eat small, like anything that they can encounter, basically anything that they would swim and bump into um, that they could grab onto. So some jellies can even eat, especially the bigger jellies, like the tougher jellies can eat small fish and other things like that. Anything that they can actually sting and grab onto with those beautiful um, tentacles and then the stinging, the, I'm sorry, the mouth uh, oral arms, the frilly kind of soft arms on the inside. As long as they can grab the food, they, they sort of eat what they can. And then anything they can't digest, they just push back out. 
So um, yeah, they, they ingest everything. That's the opposite of ingest is egest. So they just get rid of it. They can't digest it. So that is, um, this is, I love this picture. This is actually a really beautiful picture of a nettle there. So, all right. So we've talked so far about invertebrates, animals with no bones, and we've only talked about one group of animals. We've talked about the cnidarians, the stinging ones. So those are jellies, uh, anemones, and corals. We're going to switch gears, though, and we're going to move to um, another grouping of animals. And I think, Allie, maybe with our time, we're going to talk about maybe the spiny-skinned creatures instead. So um, moving to the other end of the sort of invertebrate soft, or, or sorry, um, the animals with no bones, we're going we're gonna to go to a really different kind of creature now. So maybe we can go back to that picture of the uh, North Pacific Touch Lab, take a look at what else is living there. Um, so have a look right here. Now we did talk about these, and we mentioned that the anemones would be soft to the touch. But there's another creature that lives here that doesn't have bones. Wait, that fish has bones. So that's not what I'm talking about. Let's take a look right here. What else do you notice in this picture? There's a lot of them. Did you, did you notice? Did you say sea star? Yeah, there's a bunch of sea stars that live here. And sea stars are another animal without bones. But it turns out they actually feel really different. So even though jellies and anemones feel really soft to the touch, um, these guys, they don't have any bones, but they actually, they actually feel kind of tough. And that's because these are spiny skinned creatures. Uh, and that's what we're going to be exploring next. So sea stars are, a, are part of a grouping of animals with spiny skin. And these are all called echinoderms. So I'm going to write that word out um, so you can see that echinoderm. Now, derm is the uh, root that we as scientists use that means skin. So like a dermatologist is a doctor that see, you know, takes care of skin. Echino means spiny. So we have the spiny uh, skin creatures. And this includes sea stars, sea urchins. Um, that's what I've got most of this time, actually. Sea stars and sea urchins. But it also includes a couple of other little oddballs. So let's take a look at... Um, some sea stars right here. So I'm going to show you, this is just a model. So this is actually um, a rubber, rubber model of one. It looks really realistic though. Um, but let's make some observations about the sea star. So you see right here, these are some bat stars like we have on exhibit. What's something you notice about the sea stars? Okay, I'll give you another moment to just think about what you notice about them. We did mention that if you were to touch one, how do you think it would feel? Yeah, I always want them to feel soft, but they actually, they kind of feel bumpy to me. Um, and some of them feel really bumpy. Like the one, the model that I'm holding is of an ochre star. Is this the same kind of sea star as this one? No, you're right. This is a different kind of sea star, um, but these actually feel really, really bumpy. Yeah, this is the kind of sea star. You know what always makes me think of? Things, you know, have you ever had like a pretzel with like the big salt on it? Yeah, that's what this makes me think of is like the, the bumpiness of the big pretzels with salt on them. So uh, the crunchy pretzels with salt on them. So they actually feel really, really rough. So this is sort of a spiny skin creature. The bat stars that we were looking at feel a little bit different. What else do you notice about sea stars though? Hmm. Wait, there's a number that sort of sticks out to me. What number do you think of when you think of sea stars? <laughs> Did you say three? No. Seven? No. Five? Yes! Right! The sea star has five arms. At least this one does. Wait, let's go back and look at the bat stars. Did those also have five arms? <gasps> Wait, it turns out these have five arms also. And it turns out five is a big deal for sea stars. Now, not all of them have five arms. There are some of them that actually have many, many more arms, like the sunflower star right here. You can see this has one, two, three, four, five, six, I don't actually know. We can take a moment to count. <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six, 
7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Is it 20? This one might be 19. 20? 19 arms? It's usually multiples of five or close to multiples of five, and it depends. Now, sea stars can lose an arm if they can, um, like if a predator comes and um, maybe nibbles at it or chomps at it, it can actually um, lose arms. And sometimes every once in a while they will grow those arms back. They're usually a little bit smaller. Or sometimes they can just be born with extra arms too. Um, but this is a really great view of a sea star, a sunflower star that has many, many arms. Now. This is a different view than what we were looking at with like this model. So earlier I was showing you the model and we were looking kind of like at the top side and it was the bumpy side I told you about. But this is actually the bottom. What do you notice about the bottom side of the sea stars? Hmm. Does it look hairy to you? Yeah, they actually look kind of hairy because if we were to zoom all the way in on that, these spiny skinned creatures, these echinoderms, actually have teeny little suction cups. And these are called tube feet. T-U-B-E, -E, like tube, and then feet. So they actually have tube feet that stick to things. And that's why whenever you see a sea star, maybe you saw, you've seen them at the tide pools or um, on exhibit here at the aquarium, they are, they're rock climbers. They stick to rocks. And they're really good at that because they have these great tube feet. So this is a nice view um, of now this time a sea star that has five arms and you can actually see like their little like little suction cups that come out. It's also how they breathe but they use all of these tube feet to stick and this is tube feet is actually the thing that's common with all the echinoderms. So they have spiny skin and they all have tube feet. Now we got, we're getting some great questions. Miss M's class wants to know um, are there endangered invertebrates? There are. Um, there are a, a number of them, and we'll come back to that. Um, Jagger has another great question. Why do stars come in so many colors? Great question. So it actually depends on the type of sea star, but um, they come in different colors just as people come in different colors. Um, and it's not related to, um, it's not typically related to anything environmental. Although um, some areas may have more purple ones, some areas may have more brownish ones, um, but it's not usually related to like anything they eat. Um, they just happen to come in a variety of colors. And uh, these colors, um, in some places help them blend in and in some places it, like if there's like lots of red seaweeds and things like that around the rocks um, and in some cases they help them stand out so um, lots of different it just depends on the type of sea star uh, they all have uh, different colors and different types of sea stars have different sort of shades of colors um, miss nicolosi's class wanted to know how do sea stars eat which is one of my favorite things to talk about because they eat really differently than you and I do. So now, now, if I put a, a plate of nachos in front of you, you'd probably just take a chip, one, something with a chip with like lots of stuff on it, right? Of course, right? And you would just like scoop up the chip with the cheese and all the yummy things on it and just pop it all into your mouth. Well, it's different with the sea star because it turns out the sea star doesn't have a lot of space inside of it. Take a look at my model right here, right? There's not that much space in there. So you know what some sea stars have to do? They eat on the outside of their body. And this is how they do it. Inside uh, the middle of all of these arms right here is a mouth. And inside the mouth, it's connected to their digestive system. Just like your mouth, you have a long tube that connects to your belly, right? These guys have a mouth that connects to their stomach. And what happens is the, these types of sea stars, it's a, a specific kind of sea star, will crawl over to the food they want to eat. They sit on top of their food and then they push their stomach out like this. So this is actually a sea star, sea star stomach right here. They push their stomach out and then they use their stomach to wrap around the food and then the digestive stuff starts going and then they're able to mash up their food and when it becomes really soft and like mashy, right? It's a lot easier to fit inside of their body. And then they pull their stomach back inside. Can you imagine if that's how we ate? If you saw that the nachos and then you just like spit your stomach out and your stomach wrapped up around the nachos and digested, and then you put your stomach back inside. 
That's how a sea star eats. Isn't that amazing? It's a great adaptation for an animal that has those spiny skin, doesn't have a lot of room in there, and in fact, their bodies are pretty tough. So they eat on the outside sometimes. It just depends on the type of sea star. There are sea stars that also eat different types of food. So some of them eat like the sandy bottom. They'll eat like mud and, and um, pull in a bunch of mud and like pick pieces out. They do all sorts of different things depending on the type of sea star. But a lot of the ones that we have here at the aquarium eat on the outside of their body. So great questions there. Um, I think this one is a tropical. It looks like a um, maybe a chocolate chip. Uh, chocolate chip sea star. So it actually looks like a chocolate chip cookie. It has like the spines on it are like little, they look like those mini chocolate chips. So it looks like a cookie, which I think is really neat. So this is an example of a spiny skinned creature. Now remember, spiny skinned creatures like echinoderms here, like sea stars, have the hard plates on the outside and then they also have the tube feet, which is um, on the bottom. You can see a great view of these right here. Other cousins of the sea stars had those spiny plates and the two feet as well. I'm gonna show you a cousin of the sea star. Um, this time, this is actually the, um, I'm gonna come over to the side here. And this is a, an urchin. So some of you might've seen an urchin. This is actually just the urchin test. So this is the, um, the sort of hard part on the inside and you can see that there's little spines right there. So that's the spiny skin part. Um, and normally, uh, on the outside of this, it would have long pokey spines. Um, and I don't know, Allie, if we have an easily accessible picture. Oh, right here. So this is what an urchin actually looks like. Now, if you were to see this urchin underwater, um, you could actually see between all those spines, they have soft looking hairs with two feet. They're actually two feet. So their two feet are long and have little suckers at the very end um, and the tube feet would be all oh right here like in between all their spines so this is how you know this is another spiny skinned creature it's got those spines spiny skin and the tube feet so this is the cousin of a sea star and they eat um, a little bit differently though they still crawl over and they sit on top of their food because their mouth is on the bottom, just like a sea star. Um, but instead, these guys use um, a special mouth part. It looks like five little teeth, like this. And um, it's called an Aristotle's lantern, and they pick at their food. So for example, um, that the one that we saw earlier, oh, this is a great view of the mouth right there. So this is the bottom of a sea urchin. And this sea urchin would go park on top of something it wants to eat, and then, um, like for example, if it eats algae or seaweed and then the mouth parts would come out and they go pluck, pluck, pluck. And that's actually how they eat. They just crawl on top of food and pluck, pluck, pluck all day. And that helps them um, pull in like little bits of algae or other things that they eat. Different urchins have different diets. So it just depends on the type of urchin. But this is a great view of that urchin's mouth. This is a tropical urchin, I think. It looks like one at least. So we can see um, the, the mouth parts right there on the bottom. So really unusual animals. Now the um, other cousins that I, I actually don't have a specimen to show you, but for those of you that have ever gone walking on the beach and you've seen sand dollars, sand dollars are another echinoderm. They actually have little spines if you've ever seen the edge. So a sand dollar, when you find it, it will look like a big, um, usually gray or purple disc. And they usually have teeny little spines at the edges, not enough to poke you, um, but you can definitely see the little little spines. They almost look like rough um, little furry parts. Uh, and they actually also have two feet too. So sand dollars are another cousin of that. And those are really different animals. So the echinoderms are really, really different animals than the cnidarians. Now, I do wanna um, sort of wrap up and go back to Mrs. Miss M's class question about endangered invertebrates. There are endangered invertebrates. And now for a long time, when you think about endangered species, those are the animals where there's not very many of them left in the wild. Now, a lot of times we think of animals like maybe pandas, right? Or sort of these um, rhinos or elephants and things like that. You know, it took a long time before we as scientists even started thinking about invertebrates that were endangered. And the very first invertebrate to make the endangered species 